Hello, homies, and welcome to Chatty AF, the <laughs> anime feminist podcast. We're off to a good start, right? You didn't I'm Dee Hogan, a writer and, <laughs> and editor for Annie Femme, as well as the owner of the friendly neighborhood anime blog, The Jose Next Door. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Uh, I'm the owner of the blog heroinproblem.com um, and a writer and contributor for Anime Feminist. Hi, I'm Bri Kaiser. I'm a writer and editor for Anime Feminist. Uh, I've died now. But you can still find me by putting Bri Kaiser into Google, where I do all the things. And today we are stumbling merrily forward in our watch-along of the 1990s shoujo fantasy, Shigi Yugi. This week's podcast covers episodes 21 through 27, which takes us through a warrior throwdown, a botch summoning ceremony, dead toddlers, and onto the end of part one. Uh, in case you're just joining us, this is an odd place to do that, but, you know, you do you. Uh, all three of us have watched or read at least part of the series before, so we know what's coming. That said, we want these watch-longs to be newbie-friendly, so we'll just be focusing on the events in these episodes and avoid future spoilers. And uh, let's get the show on the road. Oh, sorry, what's up? No, in fairness, they're, like we're getting to a point where there's really only one other major spoiler I remember, so at this point the audience and I are kind of simpatico. <laughs> yeah, we're getting very close to to you enjoying this experience um, with fresh eyes, which will be a super fun. Oh uh, boy! Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's get this show on the road. There is a lot to talk about this week. Uh, this batch of episodes is basically three mini arcs that have kind of a domino effect on each other. Um, so I do want to try to kind of keep things chronological um, and kind of discuss the plot mm -hmm. points in order. Um, having said that, I was thinking over our last podcast, and I kind of realized that in our excitement about what a good, good boy Toski is, so good. we, so we kind of just ignored the fact that he keeps talking about how he hates girls. And, like, clearly none of us are bothered by this, because we never mentioned it, but um, this is anime feminist, so we should probably at least talk about, like, why that why that's not a, an issue for us. I mean... Well, it, it never manifests. It's all lip service. He says it, but he doesn't, like, act disrespectful to Miyaka. Um, Who is the well, only except girl for he weird, real... Except for, like, the weird opening where he tries yeah. to, like, kiss her, and then she punches him, and then they're fine. But he's, like, but, yeah. 16. It's, it's posture. 17, but yeah. 17? Oh. He's yeah, old. he and Tamahomi are the same age. Okay. Well, it's, it's posturing, and nothing ever really happens with it. Like, it's a little creepy at first, but after they get that out of the way then you know he's he he's fine with everyone like he um he's perfectly respect like i mean not respectful but you know he he treats miyaka as an equal um you know he jokes with her and uh teases her the same way he teases everyone else in the uh in the party yeah, he's, he's a little bit of a jerk to Noriko, but it feels like a give and take, and they're very cute. Yeah, they razz each other back and forth, kind of in the same way he and, mm -hmm. he and Tamahome start, start their bromance this week, uh, <laughs> yeah. where, they, where, they, where their, their whole thing is they just like pick on each other. And since it does have that give and take, it's, it's amusing instead of feeling kind of mean. Yeah. And, and uh, also, I tend to read Toski as closeted, like I usually do with the whole... Me too. <laughs> I didn't know I did until this time, and I'm like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> um... Well, yeah, and to me, it just, it feels more like when he says it, it feels more just like an, an immaturity thing, like, like, ew, girls have cooties kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't really feel like it's, like, it's misogyny so much as just somebody who, who is, who is kind of a dumb kid and says a thing without actually, like, meaning the thing he's saying. Um, he also, like, I don't think this comes up in the anime, but, like, the reason he doesn't, the reason he always talks about how he doesn't like girls is he has five older sisters and um, some of them are just like older sister, or just kind of like shitty to him in the way like siblings can be kind of shitty to each other. Mm -hmm. um, like one of them like tricks him into like giving her his you know ice cream that he bought that week kind of stuff. Oh no! Um, yeah, and it's kind of like she'll be like, "I'm sick, cough, cough. The only thing that will make me better is this thing you bought." And he's like, "You can have it." There's a really cute little um, side story. It's it's cute and problematic. A little side story that. <laughs> made it into uh i think it was the perfect world uh magazine manga magazine that ran for a while with both genbu kaiden and fushigi yugi in it 
Um, and you get you get this this side story that happens actually right about the time part one ends, where they're on the boat and Miyaka talks to Toski about like, hey, why don't you like girls? And she's like, maybe we just need to find the right type of girl for you. And she like goes through all these types, and he's like, no, that reminds me of this other sister I had. And so he's like, just not into it. Um, and some of them are kind of funny. Some of them are like actively awful. Um, his older sister, his oldest sister, basically like emotionally abused him. Um, like just spent a lot of time telling him how awful and worthless he was. Um, and then one of his sisters, I hesitate to call it sexual assault, but it's pretty close. Um, she was very busty and like was very insistent that they keep taking baths together, even when he was like way too old for that. Uh. Um, and it's played as it's supposed to be played as kind of like comedic in the in the script. And I read it and went, "This is uncomfortable." Um, so all that having been said, Toski's Toski's sense of like I hate girls kind of makes more sense too. I think. Yeah, um, and like his, I remember reading that his dad was really weak-willed and just sort of let his the whole family run roughshod over him. They kind of just forget um, the dad exists. Like, he does show up in the manga, never in the anime, um, and they're like, where is your dad? And he's like, I'm sitting right here. And, yeah. Uh, um, so, so yeah, Toski had this whole, like, I got to go out and be a man thing going on when he when he mm -hmm. ran off to the to Raikaku bandits. And so yeah. that's, that's kind of where he is when you meet him. And I do think he has, like, some subtle character growth throughout mm -hmm. um, in terms of kind of being like, well, maybe hating girls is a bit much, because he and Miyaka obviously have a pretty good relationship, so. Yeah, like, he, they he's going to grow friendship. up and grow out of it, like, um, you know, he he's going to have, like, he honestly, like, I think he has probably some of the most balanced uh, interactions with the rest of the cast. Does that make sense? I, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, like, I think he and Noriko interact with the other characters, it, with, like, everybody very well and very mm -hmm. differently, which is which is fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he teases everyone in a way that doesn't mm -hmm. feel malicious. And, like, you know, like, if he crosses a line, like, you know... He gets punched into a wall. Shit right back. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. uh, he gets turned know, into he's, a wall, he's, Angel. He's... <laughs> He's he's sort of clueless um, in that yeah. way that, like, it, it, there's no malice there. Um, no. Yeah, and, and actually the fact that he's the, the comedy, like, specifically with Noriko, like, it doesn't bother me when he teases them because, you know, the punishment is immediate and karmic. And then there's, like, fucking Tamahome who gets away with it every time. And I am growing slowly to hate him just a little. <laughs> Yeah, most mm. most of what Tamahome does this week, I'm actually pretty okay with, and we'll we'll get into that too. Um, in terms of, like, there was a moment about four episodes in when I wrote in my notes, I like Tamahome with the <laughs> yeah. question mark. Um, didn't see that coming, um, but we'll we'll kind of we'll kind of get to that as we go. Um, I think that was when during the summoning ceremony when he's like trying to steal everyone's power ups, and I was just having a really good time with that scene. I was like, damn it, you're fun. Okay, that was a cute um, scene. It was. Um, okay, but yeah, so I, I did want us to have a little conversation about that because I felt like it was something we should at least address. So I'm um, yeah. glad we did mm -hmm. that. Um, and with that covered, let's move back into these episodes. Uh, welcome back to Conan Miyaka. Your arm is broken and your boyfriend is evil. Uh, <laughs> you're in a really vulnerable place right now. Uh, how are you and your noble warriors going to handle that? Well, um, let's kind of, so yeah, let's talk about that. I'm going to Disneyland. Well, okay, Caitlin? <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna get hit on relentlessly by the emperor. Yeah, this Hotohori fucker. Is still trash. Oh. You know, every scene with Hotohori, I think about like how they could have written him in a way to be kind of a sympathetic, um, like unrequited love. Like so. So this kind of starts with like Miyaka is kind of pretending to. She's putting on a brave face, which she has a tendency to do, um, but she's very upset and kind of I'm not even sure she realizes how upset she is until she like walks by mm -hmm. Tamahome's empty room um, in the manga it is very clear that walking into the pond is a suicide attempt yes. um, in the yes. anime it kind of feels like she's like hallucinating and mm -hmm. does it without realizing what she's doing yeah, um, yeah there's not um, a lot of interesting to me. scene I feel like in the anime because it feels it feels too like the earlier scene where she was just mm -hmm. meeting Noriko like an accident, mm -hmm. like you said. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, it was definitely a suicide attempt, and I honestly, I hate that trope. Mm -hmm. um, because it feels like it is, um, you know, even when they are rescued and, like, the characters are like, oh, you have so much to live for, blah, blah, blah. It feels like it's romanticizing yeah, it. it like, 
Yeah. Um, it, it's r- romanticizing the idea that, like, oh, no, I've broken up. Uh, I cannot stand to live. Um, tra- you know, and I'm going to tragically commit suicide yeah. over my broken heart. Yeah, I was... And, uh, like, well, one thing I will give the... And the other thing about the manga is um, something they establish in the manga is that the hair ribbon that she has, she gave one to Keisuke, and that was going to be the way she could get home if she had to. Um, so in the manga, she loses the hair ribbon in... Um, Kuto. So as she's walking out in the rain, she's thinking, Tamahome's gone. Yui hates me. Mm-hmm. I have no way of getting home, and we can't, we can't even summon Suzaku because one of our warriors is functionally dead. So in the manga, it feels more like there is nothing, like, I've lost everything. Um, it's not just like, oh, I broke up with my boyfriend. Um, yeah. And so I think it's more powerful in that sense, mm-hmm. but I think that's also why it being a suicide attempt in the manga makes more sense, whereas in the anime, it's right. more like she just kind of yeah, I don't know, it, like it's half asleep almost. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was I was watching this batch of episodes with my with my partner who does not care for this mm-hmm. show, but she pointed <laughs> out that um this that section is essentially the cliff diving scene from the second Twilight book, where she's so sad and depressed. Yes, that's it's, what I was yeah. thinking of. Yeah, the way it, the way they play it in the anime, especially, I think it yeah. reads it reads that way. Yeah, clearly um, Stephanie Meyer is a big fan of Fushigi Yugi <laughs> um, because Fushigi Yugi came first. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and the thing about it is, like, like Hotohori rescues her, which is great. And there's there's a version of the scene afterwards where he could be like, I know you feel like you've lost everything, but, you know, you've still got me. You've still got the other warriors. We're here for you, whatever you need. Right, like, we'll And find he would have been way. like, oh, what a sweet guy. Mm-hmm. You know, he loves her and he's and he's being supportive. Um, but no, no, that is not how that scene goes. No, of course um, not. The way that scene goes is Hotohori, not only does he pretend like he's been bottling up these feelings for her forever. Oh my god. Which, uh, every time Tom was so is gone, he makes out me. with her. Um, that was so frustrating to me. Because, yeah, he's acting like he's been, like, trying to conceal his feelings and fight, you know, fight them off. And he's, you know, he's like, oh, I just can't. I can't fight this feeling anymore, <laughs> and I can't remember what I started fighting them for. Um, <laughs> Thank you. No, but like um, he, so he acts like it's just been this big secret that he's been concealing, and no one has any idea. But he's been very upfront and very aggressive mm-hmm. about him the whole time. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, and it's just really irritating. That's it. Yeah, like, I don't know. A, I, there's a uh, version of this of this world in there's a version of reality in Hotohori's head that is like slightly to the left of the real one um, <laughs> and he, uh, he just he seems to think things did not go down the way they actually did um, and he either, continues to not make things better what were you gonna say oh e- either that or he assumes that Miyaka has the collective memory of a goldfish and Which, now that <laughs> to be fair he did just find her in a lake so <laughs> Like, he's gone now. Maybe she forgot that I had the hots for her. <laughs> I can try this it's again, right? It's been so long. And I know part of that is also that time is not well established in the anime. Like, they were traveling for a while. And I think the last time he macked on her was, like, right before they met Toski. Mm. Um, but still, dude, yeah. you've, not been, you've not been subtle. Anime does uh. not have a great sense of the passage of time. Like, no. um, there's been a call. I think they've like referenced a couple of times that it's been a few months. Mm-hmm. It has. Yeah. It's been at least a few months, and I think it was a few months before she left the first time too. So, mm-hmm. um, like a, a significant amount of time has passed, but because we don't necessarily get that feeling, like maybe Hotohori hasn't said anything about it for like months, and so he does feel like. But I, it's still shitty. It's still shitty to pretend yeah, like you've right. never, like, you've never told her oh. that you care about her when you've told her. At least twice. I think three times. And and the moment Tamahomi leaves view. Mm-hmm. Like, literally, yeah, like, she's he in doesn't... a really vulnerable place, too. Like, he kind of takes advantage of the fact that Miyaka is in a very vulnerable place yeah. when he does this. Um, I don't think he, I mean, I don't think he's consciously taking advantage. Um, no. No, but male privilege, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially like, Hotel Horace. Not... Uh, especially Emperor Privilege. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then he, he, he continues to be very frustrating because uh, Bizarro Tamahome shows up to, you know, finally, finally kill the priestess. And, like, I totally don't blame Hotohori for being like, fuck, that's not going to happen. I'm going to stop him. Mm. Yeah. Um, but then, but he locks her in a room. Like, oh! right? like he, he, he just, he denies, he denies Miyaka agency in a way that the rest of the warriors don't. And it's yeah. very frustrating. Like, he's, he's clearly, like, he takes control of her a lot. 
uh, in a way that the other characters don't. Like, the other characters, they more or less respect her as their leader. Like Yeah, yeah they want to support like, her. Mm -hmm. Like, like yeah, she's, like, kind of ditzy, and there's plenty of times where they have to be like, Miyaka, Miyaka, no. But she's still, yeah. like, very much the one calling the shots. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas Hodohori clearly is, like, thinks he knows best for her constantly, um, even though I don't think he's that much brighter than she is. Um, <laughs> and I would like, agree with that. <laughs> and, like, is, so he's just trying to control her all the time. And yeah. I'm sure it has to do with him being, like, you know, the emperor, the young emperor of a country. But, like, it's just, it's so not okay. And, like, oh, I can't believe it. And he's treated in the narrative like some tragic romantic hero who's just yeah. hiding away yeah um i, I think that's the without ever yeah. being the, the, called out the most uncomfortable part is that like we're implicitly supposed to mm -hmm. to feel for these actions he takes like if he was just like the yeah. shitty guy who clearly didn't respect her uh, as a character we could work with that mm -hmm. but no or if, or if he grew, mm -hmm. like if he's, because they, they kind of set it up like there's going to be an arc with him, like early on when he's like, I'll order Noriko to um, get along with you, and Miyaka's like, you can't order people's feelings, dude. Um, I mean, it feels like that's time. supposed to be an arc, and there kind of is, and we will talk about that mm -hmm. after we after we get through the Bizarro Tamahome stuff, yeah. Um, because I do I do want to talk about that that kind of final scene Miyaka and Hotori have mm -hmm. together. Um, but there's not, it doesn't feel like there's, because it feels like he's still doing a lot of the stuff that is frustrating about in terms of like not letting other people make their choices. So he locks Miyaka in a room and Miyaka, um, not one to sit passively by, uh, bless her for that. If nothing else, um, climbs out of a window, um, to, to, uh, <laughs> see if she can, see if she can have something to do with this, see if she can uh, stop this fight. Um, and she kind of stops the fight by distracting yeah. Ta Bizarro Tamahome long enough for Hodori to stab him through the middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, offers her life up so that... Why does she offer to let him kill her? Just because she... she He's dying, and cause? she basically she's 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 freaking out. She's she's freaking out about the fact that this guy she loves is dying, and she's like she's like, fine, you can you can kill me, but you have to get better. Like you have to. I need you to. Basically, it's this sense of like, I don't want you to die so much that I'm willing mm -hmm. to risk my. I'm willing to die to make that happen. Um, and obviously, that has a lot of issues. Um, but they both. I feel like they both do that. Like I feel like Fushigi Yugi really plays on this idea of. Um, I guess sacrificial love. I'm not sure if that's yeah. quite the way I want to word it, but that is that's 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 the words that came out of my mouth. Yeah, which so. I'm not super huge on as a theme. Um, no, I'm not either. But in I don't know in the moment of Tamahome bleeding out um, on the steps of the palace, um, I I sympathize with her. Like I I get why that is her reaction. Like I'll do I'll like bargaining. Like I'll do anything. I just don't want you to die. Um, I guess I just yeah no like. Like, honestly, like, that, that trope has um, sort of, since I, I left my teen romantic phase, um, been one of my big, like, irritants. Yeah. Like, whenever yeah, no, I understand. It's, and I think it's harder to sell, too, because there's no way that Tom, like, it's very clear there's no way that Tom Homeway's going to die. Yeah, but at this point, he is still evil. So, like, we know Mitsukake is standing right there and can, like, and can, like, heal him. So he's probably not going to die. Mm -hmm. um, but... But like, like he is still, but he's still a bad guy at that point, and and then Miyaka's love makes him not bad anymore. Yeah, no, that, that, that's what I'm saying though. Is like those moments that oh, are stupid. If but I sing, can can we like just uh, insert a clip of the Huey Lewis in the News song? That's the power of love, right here. <laughs> yes. Nice. I don't think we have the rights to that, but you know, uh, we'll just I mean, ask yeah, our listeners to a, uh, listeners just go find life. it on like Spotify or YouTube or something and just play it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I have to admit, though, that scene when he when he comes back to himself and like clearly doesn't remember anything, but is like, "Oh, I'm sorry," and she's like, "It's okay. The moon's up now." And I, I'm, I, it gets me. Aww. It gets me, you guys. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big. It's not a great. We've talked about this before. They're not a great couple. Most of the time, I don't. Re, I'm not really rooting for them or really like feeling yeah. anything about their relationship. But something about that fucking scene. Every time I watch it, um, it it hits me. It's just I don't know. I like it. It's very well played. Yeah, no, the bit where he wakes up is, is nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and that's that's the end of Bizarro Tamahome. They they heal him. Toski has to go another day with multiple broken bones and contusions. Yeah, uh, uh, apparently uh, fuck Toski. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Mitsukake can only do it one per day, and I don't know, if I were Miyaka, I would have said, hey, that guy's bleeding internally, help him, I just have I a broken see. arm, it'll be okay. Yeah. Um, but Mitsukake uh, is terrible at conserving his spell slots, and they are very He yeah. only has uh, one slot. spell slot, is that the thing, <laughs> and... And Tamahome was bleeding <laughs> out, so they really didn't have a choice on that one. Yeah. Um, I also could, the other thing is we don't see it, but I could totally see Toski being like, no, help her first, I'm fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, Toski makes a big yeah. show of, like, Toski is totally the kind of guy who makes a big show about whining com and complaining, but then it's like, no, 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 it's good, take care of her. I'm just going to sit here and bitch for, like, you know, another two yeah. hours. <laughs> oh, I wish we could have seen that. I do love that. I love that little scene of Mitsukake healing, of Mitsukake like banishing him up, and he's yelling at him. Mitsukake is like lists off all his injuries and is like, "Nothing I can do will kill you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're unkillable. I have decided." So, oh, and I yeah. hope that is true. I um, wish so, yeah, we had gotten to see more of Mitsukake. By the way, I'm sorry, I'm like leading us on a tangent, but like, no, no, I agree with you. We he's... see whenever he he's so like he's just got this very dry sense of humor. He really does. Um, it's very good. Um, I've talked about in the in the uh, visual novel. He you get a little bit more of of the Mitsukake sass and the fact that he's kind of just done. Um, there's a pretty good scene on the boat where Toski spends like the entire trip seasick and he just keeps like complaining to Mitsukake to fix him. <laughs> and Mitsukake is like, I'm not burning my one spell splat every day on your seasickness. And I don't have a lot of like, you know, ingredients for medicines out here. So he basically says like, we may as well just let him like drink himself stupid every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Toski's like, Toski's like, kiss. shut up. You're not my ma. <laughs> and they have this really fun, like, like clearly do not like each other kind of dynamic. And uh, then Chichiri comes out and trolls Toski for a while, and uh, it's it's a it's a fun scene. I wish there was more of that in the anime itself. Um, the visual novel lets the characters kind of ensemble cast fool around, and it's should, pretty good. I should play I should play the visual novel. You'd have I think you'd have a good time. It is not without its issues. Some of the plot points, like they streamline things, and it's stupid. <laughs> but like they handle they handle Noriko a lot better um, in the visual novel. As long as you don't play their root. If you play their root, there's a lot of that. Like, well, I feel like a man now because I like a girl kind of thing, <sighs> which is really frustrating. Um, but if you don't play if you don't play Noriko's root, like there you could theoretically play the game without finding out that Noriko is assigned male at birth. Um, and then they're just oh, then they're just a, a lady the whole time. Um, but You're like the characters are a lot nicer and there's no like shitty jokes really. Um, Toski makes a couple of comments, but they're vague enough that it, it doesn't necessarily it feels like it could just be them like it could just could be Toski giving Rico shit about being like super strong and kind of temperamental. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, the visual novel is, it's fun. And there's a translation out there for you, Caitlin. So, <laughs> okay. Um, hook me up with that later. Uh, that, that, that would help a little bit, I guess. Um, but yeah, no, the, yeah, the stuff with Mitsukake in the, in the game is, is fun and it helps kind of supplement, uh, the fact that he really doesn't get to do anything in the anime. Um, but yeah, okay. So that's the, that's the, that's the first kind of arc, Bizarro Tamahome. Um, and then we're kind of like revving up for the summoning ceremony. But before we can get to that, we get to what I like to call the love triangle that isn't. Um, which <laughs> is because, and I really, I love, there's this sense in Fushigi Yugi that someone told Watase she had to have a love triangle in this story. Yeah. And she went, fine, I guess. And then really just kind of played with the tropes because, um, uh, Caitlin, you were mentioning this in the Slack group that we, that we chat in, um, that... Um, Miyaka never is really into Hotohori, like, at all. No. Like, it, there's never any question who she's going to go with. Like, yeah. it's always Tamahome all the time. She never looks away from him. The only time she ever, like, remotely considers straying is when, um, you know, he's evil and has attacked her and she's super vulnerable and Hotohori's like, hey, just come settle for me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that song from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Settle For Me. It's a good song. Everyone should YouTube that, too. Um, that's Helta Hori in, in these moments. Um, and I like that it was like, Watase was like, okay, the boys have to fight over her, but works it in such a way where, like, one of them is cursed. So it's not even really like a stupid romance triangle, like, fighting over the girl. It's like, this guy's evil right now, so... Yeah, the, um, the I, do, I do like the way the love triangle in this does not really follow the typical, like, very tired love mm -hmm. triangle pattern. Um, and you see that sometimes in shoujo manga where it 
it does feel like it was the editor forced an issue. Um, yeah. I saw that in From Far Away as well. Like, there was a very brief love triangle that resolved itself pretty much immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, that sort of felt like the editor being like, nope, you gotta have the love triangle. Um, because that that is the sort of trope that editors uh, do demand. To yeah, have it's like, it's like this is how we inject conflict into this romance. Um, um, so anytime series can kind of, like, subvert or play with that, I appreciate it, because I'm not a huge fan of the... I'm not a huge fan of love triangles in general. I'm I'm okay with like an unrequited love situation, um, but when you play it as like a like a triangle, it, it gets obnoxious. Yeah, um, um, it, it has to be done really how, well. Yeah, uh, well, uh, how in um, the Hunger Games, apparently, Gail was originally supposed to be Katniss's cousin. Um, oh, I did not know that. Yeah, I mean, this is I I, I don't know how confirmed this is. Like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> But, like, I, I read a thing on the internet, which we all know is the most reliable source of information. Yes. Um, I, I, I mean, I'd buy Gale... it because all of his scenes that are supposed to be romantic feel super forced. Yeah. That, but, yeah. like, Gail was supposed to be Katniss's cousin, but the editors were like, hey, you know what's really popular right now? Twilight. You know what Twilight has that people, like, are arguing about? A love triangle. A garbage love triangle. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, okay, we shouldn't so, we shouldn't go down the. I, I was like, I'm about to I'm about to launch into a Twilight rant. No one wants to hear that. It's been no. years. It's not even really relevant anymore. No. We can we can <laughs> we can slide past that. Yes. Okay. Um, so I did want to kind of talk about. Um, it's the one scene where I think Hotohori does a not terrible thing. Um, Miyaka goes to talk to him before the summoning ceremony to basically be like, "Hey, so I'm. This is probably obvious, but like, I'm not into you. And Tomahome and I are together, and that's kind of how it is." Um, and she frames it in a way that is very, I think, relatable in that she apologizes for not yeah. liking him back, um, and kind of talks about like she feels like you know he's given her so much assault um she doesn't add that part <laughs> i added that part um but she feels like he's like given her so much and that she hasn't given him anything mm-hmm. back and i will give hotahori credit here he does not realize that he's been a shit heel this whole time but he tells her no you don't have to apologize those are your feelings and those are those are those are fine um and he's like and you know you're gonna save my kingdom and that's that's something that's all that's a lot um so I do have to give him some credit for not doing that that shitty thing that that happens a lot of the time in in both fiction and real life, where it's like, "But I love you. Why don't you love me back, you asshole?" Um, so yeah, I will I will give him credit that. if that holds. Yeah, and, yeah. And the, well, he's written um, out of the show by the end of part one. So yeah, he's, he, he's they get on a boat him. and they leave his ass. <laughs> yeah, like he he is not there for a long time, which actually kind of makes me wonder if like they just didn't know how to write him if he's not like pursuing miyaka like we can't yeah con- what's like, what's we, they might have been done with him. this yeah mm-hmm. we can't continue yeah, but he has so many goal. other great great character traits like um like he's very vain pretty uh, hair very entitled he has pretty <laughs> hair he does have pretty hair and stupid shoes <laughs> Um, I mean, that's just historical. <laughs> I know, but they're still <laughs> stupid. Um, yeah, so I this so I was watching that scene going, Well, Hotahori, you, you you done good there. I'm 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 kind of proud of you for at the very least not not uh, at the very least like not blaming Miyaka for for not wanting to hook up with you. Um and I do the flashbacks of him, like, as we've talked about, like, the fact that he's put her on a pedestal and he's really in love with the idea of the priestess of Suzaku and not with Miyaka herself and how that sucks. And it's probably one of the main reasons Miyaka doesn't like him. Um, but the flashbacks of him as a lonely little kid do do make me feel kind of I find him a little pitiable because he's like, maybe someone will love me for myself and not for be, not for like this title I have. Even yeah, though he, but does the, he does that to her. That's so and I don't think he, it like, really he's is literally loving her because she is the priestess of Suzaku and not who she is. And, you know, maybe maybe like he did, like uh, if the show had addressed like, yeah, at first, like I I was in love with you because uh you're the priestess of suzaku and you're this idea but then i actually did uh come to fall in love with like your personality um and fall in love with you for you but that there's so much in the show that like it's just on the edge just on the edge of being like good and handling things well but then it just doesn't quite close the deal and i mean 
Uwatase was a really young writer when she made it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this was only her second series. Um, but it's just, it's so frustrating sometimes because, like, you know, like I said, I think we're really a lot softer on the show than a lot of people are. Like, um, you know, I think most people who um, are looking at it through a critical eye come are much harsher about it than we are oh yes i hear about it on the Uh, weekly (laughs) oh oh boy (laughs) um like so but um you know there there's still just like there's so much stuff that's like just seal the deal please come on they're so close um yeah it's it's a series it's one of those series where um I learned this term from Vry when we were talking about Lovecraft a while back. Um, it it's like a it's like there's a fix fic quality to it where like if I could reboot anything it would be Fushigi Yugi because oh God. it's so close to being really great I and I'm mean, like okay if we Genby just make Kaiden, these changes um, we could have does a really exist. huh Genbu Kaiden Genby does Kaiden. exist it's not it's not exactly a reboot but it is it no. is it does improve upon the central structure of the story in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, I, I mean there is good so. stuff in Fushigi Yugi and I think. You know, it's it's worth talking about and engaging with, but you do have to meet the series mm-hmm. more than halfway. <laughs> like a yeah, lot you of do. and time. I think well, and you have to be aware that it was written in ninety two, mm-hmm. animated in what, ninety six, ninety seven? Um Yeah, 90, I think it's ninety five. There's a lot of there's a lot of flaws in terms of like um sometimes with the narrative, especially in the second half, which we'll get to eventually. Um, and sometimes with um the not necessarily the things the characters do, but the way the series frames what they do, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Like, like, like it's okay to have characters who are kind of shitty, but then if you don't like, if if you act like that's okay, mm-hmm. then you've got then you've got a a, a narrative flaw. Yeah, um, yeah. But there's a lot of emotional honesty and rawness to it, which I think is I think is what drew me to it. Um, and and still like like mm-hmm. rewatching it now, I'm like, there's there's still a lot here to like as long as you kind of go into it going, okay, well. Yeah. It's messy. It was written by a 22-year-old. It was written in 1992. It was this, that, and I think that that helps a little bit. Or that could yeah. just be nostalgia talking, because I um, do. I mean, I still, I still have fond memories of it. Yeah, um, I completely sure. agree. I completely agree. Um, because you know, like I've said, um, you know, I was 12 when I started watching Fushi Yugi, mm-hmm. um, and I think that rawness was what drew me to the series, and I, I think Fushi Yugi is majorly instrumental into me becoming a long time anime fan Mm -hmm. Um, same here for sure because you know there was this you know this edge to it there was this emotionality to it that you really didn't get in like american cartoons so much Mm -mm. um but it still had all the it still all the like the the action adventure and the lots of stuff happening too and like yeah and like but like um you know like american cartoons in the 90s it was like what like kids shows uh the simpsons and disney movies and disney movies like you know they like they have like i don't want to trash on disney they have a lot of um you know a lot of good stuff about them like mm-hmm. you know i i i grew up watching disney i love disney yeah um, me too um but it's very polished there's not yeah there's not a lot of rawness to it which Fushigi mm-hmm. Yugi is raw um which you know like it is much closer to an actual teenager mindset which um is to its benefit and to its detriment i think yeah because um like i said that rawness is really appealing to teen audiences um but as adults like you can look at and be like oh this is actually like uh, these are not great ideas that it's putting through like this is not like something that i would be comfortable with it teaching teenagers um right like it, it feels like in exchange for the rawness of the 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 bigger like the more cutting emotional moments is this fact that it did not polish uh some of the more harmful messages that were maybe packaged yeah. in with that yeah mm-hmm. it the sense i get is more that it wasn't the series isn't how do i put this i we talked about this a couple of weeks ago too like how my love story really feels like it's trying to kind of be a guidebook for teens in terms of romance. And Fushigi Yugi feels more like it's a snapshot, I guess. It doesn't feel like it's necessarily lauding things as it is just like, this is, this is kind of how it feels. 
Um, right. And, but, and art imitates life, but then life also imitates art. Yeah. And so, so I think that you line? still do need to be able to take some kind of a stance and, and, um, kind of steer a story in a particular direction. I don't think Shigiyuki does that especially well all the time. Every once in a while, I think it, I think it hits on some pretty, on some pretty nice stuff, but uh, yeah, there are some, there are some issues and we're going to get into some of those going forward. Um, We still have quite a bit of the uh, story to talk about. Um, The next, yeah. So the next plot point um, I wrote down summoning ceremony and then my discussion notes for this section just say, sorry, homie. And then I started giggling again and I couldn't stop. Like, um, sometimes so I'm sorry I'm not watching the dub. <laughs> it's there are some good things. Yeah. So um, uh, for our for our listeners who who don't know, um, I tweeted about this and then I then I talked to Brian and Caitlin about it in our in our group chat too. Um, in the dub, there's a part where uh, Tamahome and Toski are chasing Ami Boshi um, as he's trying to escape, and. Tamahome, I mean, sorry, Toski busts out his Tessin and he's like, Rakashina, and he uses his fire and he roasts Tamahome. And it's basically like him kind of getting revenge for Tamahome beating the shit out of him back when he was evil. And um, so Tamahome grabs him and is like, what the hell, man? And uh, in the sub, Toski just says, sorry, Tama, I had to do that. Um, the dub could have changed this line to make it clearer what he's talking about. Like, like the second part of this line is payback's hell. And I actually think that's a pretty good translation. Um, I think that's a fun, a fun shift. Um, but instead of sorry, Tama, Toski gets to say, sorry, homie. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> homie. Payback's hell. Um, and oh. these, are the, these are the unique joys of a 1999 dub that uh, you just can't get anywhere else. I hope that there's fan um, art out there of Toski wearing, like, parachute pants and a backwards oh, baseball God. cap. Toski the hip hop bandit but... reminding you kids to stay in school. Yo <laughs> yo yo. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, but yeah, about about that summoning ceremony. Yeah, that is actually sort of like going back to that rawness, um, because I don't think I've ever seen a show where the main characters fuck up quite this badly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's real bad, and um, so like. Just that feeling of like, oh no, like, oh my god, this is like a mistake that they cannot just fix. Like, Mm -hmm. there is no, like, there is no turning back from this point. Yeah. And And it turns out there is something they can still do. So it's not like it's the end of the road, but Mm -hmm. they still, but it's still, it's going to be hard. It's not like they can just snap their fingers and this failure will go away. Yeah. Like, Um, they they fucked up in a big way, yeah. Um, and that's um, like they. I think that was really handled really well. Just like this sense of like they're 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 lost for a minute. They're like, yeah. What are we? What are we going to do now? Well, um, and Miyaka has this feeling of like a lot of people went through a lot to get to to get us to this point. Um, and, you know, and now it feels like that pain meant nothing. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a very rough moment for her. And I think as a character, like, she, she I think she shoulders a little too much responsibility here. A little bit um, self-flagellating. Well, I mean, but, I yeah, mean, and, and she does that. I mean, She's always Miyaka. done that. Yeah. Um, but it is good to see her go, we screwed up. And now this, and now, like, this thing we were building mm-hmm. towards is gone, and I'm so frustrated and angry at myself for this. Like, mm-hmm. I think it is good to see her taking some, res- she takes, again, I think she, I think she's a little, she's way too hard on herself here, yeah. but it's good to see her taking responsibility for this. Yeah, and, and, because um, um, especially when you think about her, like, in the early episodes when she was like, oh, sweet, yeah, I can, I can ask the gods to, like, summon a horde of hotties for me, and mm-hmm. I can pass my school test without having to try. Um, yeah. I think she's, I think no, she it- has grown, for sure. And, and even though, like, they, they can go back and get the Shinzaho to to put it in a way that is not spoilery, but still, like, the sacrifices that they end up having to make that they wouldn't have had to do otherwise, they yeah, are huge. It's, they're going to go through a lot um, because they screwed up. Like, the... Yeah, the the repercussions are are significant in a way that, like you said, like in a lot of I think in a lot of fiction that it doesn't happen that way. Um, yeah, where you fuck up and you do, you like... really have to live with those with those consequences. Yeah, it's it's 
And I, I, it's one of those scenes that I really like with the in-universe. Like, all these characters have no reason to believe that anything is going wrong. I think the Wishes segment is very cute. Um, I, I cry a little for Noriko because I'm so sorry, baby. I'm so sorry that there isn't reassignment surgery for you in ancient China. I'm so sorry. I know. But, um, like, from a stepping back from a narrative position, it can be kind of frustrating because all the characters are absolutely acting to the best of their knowledge. But as a viewer, it's like... Clearly, this fucker isn't supposed to be here. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, but, well, the manga was probably a big shock because you didn't have an opening theme mm-hmm. assuring you that that this character wasn't supposed to be mm-hmm. here. Um, so I, I bet it was more of a surprise for a manga. Absolutely. Was like, oh, I never thought, I never, yeah. su- I never suspected that either. So you could kind of have that feeling with Miyaka as well. Whereas I think for the anime viewers, it was more like I knew something was up with that guy. Um, so, and then Miyaka has this brief moment where she kind of tries to, she has, she has faith in Amiboshi in a way that is probably not earned, but, um, <laughs> but then he falls into a river. Well, so that's I, that. Miyaka definitely has, has, people don't need to earn her faith in them. No. Uh, and it, Miyaka's it, very it, trusting. It, it, and it's very hard for them to lose her faith. Like she doesn't, I don't think she finally decides that Nakago is an irredeemable asshole until after Tamahome's family gets murdered. Like, I think that's how long it took for her to go, oh, Nakago is, is the absolute worst and we have to stop him. Um, like she, she has a lot of, and I, you know, I, I wrote in my notes naivete versus faith. And I'm like, I'm not, you know, there's a, there's a thin line there. Um, but she's, she's very convinced that, that they can talk Amiboshi down off this cliff. And fun fact, in the visual novel, if you, uh, if you get a couple of favorability points with him, you can, um, and he turns him and he turns himself in and becomes a prisoner of war. And, um, then Suboshi doesn't murder anybody. Oh, that's great. Oh, so (laughs) that's great. Um, he actually doesn't murder the kids in the visual novel. The visual novel was like, that's a bit much y'all. Yeah. Um, But he, he will, if, if, if Amiboshi falls in the river, if you fuck that up and he falls in the river, um, Suboshi will kill Tamahome's dad. Um, but the kids are okay. Because Suboshi has standards. <laughs> he realized, all right, <laughs> this is a, a bit man. blatant heartstring tugging. This oh, is a I little draw the line at toddlers. And it's a very, it's, it's a very sad scene. In the, I've, played, I've played both versions in the visual novel, and it's really nice when Suboshi doesn't kill anybody. Like, you still meet him in the village, like he's doing some recon work, and he... he, he fights with you a little bit but it's not a he's like he's like return my brother to me how dare you take him prisoner but he's not like that upset um and then the other the other version where tamahome's dad is dead is very sad because miano mamaru plays tamahome and he 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 acts very well um so but then the kids are like the kids comfort him and they have a little they have a little it's kind of sweet in in its sadness um so he's able to take his family back to the capital and the kids don't die and it's nice oh good this is not not happened in the anime no, that this is not that universe. In this universe, Amiboshi falls in the river and a lot of toddlers die. <laughs> um, but we will get there. Um, the other thing that happens in this little bit is Chiriko joins the cast. Uh, Chiriko is played, the actual Chiriko, please stands up. Um, and they are, pl- they, sh- she, God, he. So when I watched the anime, I was convinced Chiriko was going to be a girl based on the character design. And then they started talking and I was like, oh, it's a girl. And then they were like, he. And I was like, oh, okay. So I still have this part of my brain that wants to use... Um, the pronoun she on Chiriko, but he joins the cast. Um, he is played by Kawakami Tomoko, who you Aww. will know as Utena. Rest um, in peace. Who, yeah, rest in peace. Um, as soon as I heard heard her voice, I got I got real happy, and then I got a little sad too. Um, but yeah, so Kawakami Tomoko joins the cast as Chiriko, and I really have nothing else to add. Chiriko doesn't really get much of an introduction. Oh uh, God, he's, he doesn't he's do very anything. smart. No, he's very smart. He saves them with a leaf whistle, and um, I guess he kind of helps Hotohori plan their trip up north, and that's about all you get out of him this week. He was like the uh, next town over and is psychic, but couldn't think to get there like an hour earlier. I know well, he's not. Right? He's not psychic. He's 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 very intelligent and can read the stars, which in this universe means that you actually can predict the future. Um, but he is not. He's not actually psychic. He's just he's just a genius. And so the anime does a very bad job of establishing this. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about it here. Um, but Chiriko's symbol. He's because he's only 13. Um, he doesn't have a good grip on his powers, and they like his symbol disappears and reappears like without his say. And when it's gone, he's just a kid. And he's actually more immature than a regular 13 year Yeah, he's um, not a very good Because he's kid. leaned on his intelligence. Um, so he's, 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 not, he's, very, he's not very bright, um, and he's kind of a crybaby. 
Um, and in the manga, at one point he admits, and again, this isn't in the anime, so I'm not spoiling anything. At one point in the manga, he admits that the reason he didn't show up early wasn't because he was busy studying. It was because he felt like he wasn't good enough yet because he kept, because his symbol kept flickering in and out. So he was like, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't join them just yet. I'm not quite ready. And he kept kind of pushing it back, pushing it back. And then finally went, oh shit, they're in trouble. I better, I, now I have to go. Um, that would have been nice to have been included. Yeah, it's a it's a good it's a good little bit of character development that again the anime doesn't doesn't ever really address and it comes up it comes up later in the manga like like quite a bit later but um, again I didn't feel like it was a big deal for me to mention it here since it's not in the anime um, yeah Chiriko doesn't doesn't have a lot to do so I don't really have anything else to say about them unless you guys do Tim. no no like okay. he does nothing like he he shows up and then we don't see him again like he barely yeah, even spends he... any time on camera. Yeah, he doesn't even really get any cute scenes. Like, there's like there's one scene where Noriko teases Toski about how uh, he could learn a thing or two from Chiriko um, and, like, you know, devote himself to studying. But I don't even think Chiriko's in that scene, so you don't really get... Um... Chiriko and Toski end up having kind of a cute little friendship in the manga that uh, doesn't really show up in the anime, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, it's very, like, in the margins of the panels, but... Um... But yeah, keep an eye on glimpses of that in the anime, cause cause blink and you and you will miss them. Um, but that's yeah, that's Chidiko, which is a which is a shame, cause I think I think both Chidiko and Mitsukake could have been really kind of fun characters, and we have thus far anyway. Um, you know, I don't want to spoil too much. Uh, we haven't gotten much from either of them, which is uh, I, I will say before we cast so like very briefly before we move on to uh, toddler murder. I love the Star Festival scene, and I just want oh, every yeah. episode to be Noriko and Toski's rom com because I love them. <laughs> It there's is delightful. Of, yeah, there's a lot of really good um, ensemble chemistry in these episodes, yes. I feel like. I think, like, I think the really friendships are better to... than the romances in Fushigi Yes. Oh, absolutely. And, like, um, they because they really start to nail, and, like, they're still, you know, poor Mitsukake and Chiriko standing on the sidelines, not really participating in, no. like, anything not being invited along it's very sad um but i mean chiriko's a child I mean, mitsukake's well, an adult i like uh, to i like to imagine that chichiri and mitsukake were like drinking sake on a porch somewhere yeah. just chatting good um, um chatting about their dead their dead girlfriends yeah <laughs> um, but um but, but like um, they really like you know the the rest of the group they they really start to nail um their interactions and they really feel like friends like mm-hmm. um yeah they don't like um early in the series one of my complaints is how Miyaka and her friends interact with each other mm-hmm. um like her friends i think are like too too mean to her like it doesn't and there's, there there's doesn't no seem give to be a and give and take, take. just yeah there's no give and take they're just kind of like teasing her for being dumb yeah and time. it's not like it's not like she's teasing them back like cuz some yeah. friendships are kind of just built on like teasing or arguing oh, or, yeah, you know absolutely. i mean i don't think i don't think there's anything wrong with that i definitely have friendships like that um but it has to be back and forth or it's just mean mm-hmm. like my 5 year relationship is uh is founded on us like aggressively flirting by teasing each other like <laughs> but but like um but yeah so they th- here we really start to get a sense that like they're teasing each other um back and forth and there's there's but there's a lot of affection there and mm-hmm. i really yeah. like i was really appreciating it during these episodes cuz um i kind of have spent the last few years sort of uh dragging Fushigi Yugi for a lot of its character writing and a lot of its dynamics and i forgot that like there are parts where it's really good and once again mm-hmm. this is a major part of the show that I fell in love with when I was 13, 12, 13 years old is that like the characters seemed like they genuinely had fun with each other. Oh yeah. I did. I could not, I did not give really two shits about Tamahome Miyaka, even as a 13 year old watching this. Um, but I loved the side characters and I loved their dynamics with each other and I just wanted them to hang out forever. Yes. Um, so yeah, no, I I agree with that. Um, although, oh, sorry, what were you gonna say? Oh no, no, no! Please say it, because because mine was going to shift a little bit. Oh, I was gonna shift us too. I was going to uh, say that we're not we're not at dead, dead toddlers just yet. Right, um, I, I, we have. Um, yeah, because like uh, you mentioned, Chichiri's t- girlfriend, and I like dead toddlers are so omnipresent that I forgot that this was also his sad backstory moments. Yeah. 
Chicherry's advice corner and backstory bodega. Yeah. Okay. I do want to talk about that. Um, do I guess, oh, I guess we can, no, I want to talk about that after we talk about one other thing, um, because it'll dovetail into some other stuff. Um, so we'll put a pin in that and we will get to Chicherry because y'all know I love talking about that boy. Uh, so right. boy. So, it's your boy, Chicherry. <laughs> it's your boy. Um, no, duh. So um, before <laughs> we get into that, I do want to talk about uh, Tight Scoon pulling Miyako aside and telling her she's got to keep it in her pants. This fucking um, subplot. Yeah. Uh <sighs> It's a very frustrating subplot. Um, Tidescoon tells Miyaka that she uh, needs to be, that the priestess has to be a virgin in order to summon the god and must be quote unquote unspoiled. The uh, Japanese word for that, um, just to bring this up, is um, she's not supposed to be kegare, which um, I actually did a bunch of research on this word for an episode of Yorikuma Arashi like two years ago. Um, so I have a lot of notes on that. Um, it's not. It's not quite, I don't want people to think of it quite in the same way that, like, the concept of, like, sin and, like, you know, you gotta be a virgin before marriage, like, in the Western world, because it's not exactly that. Um, it's more tied to this concept of, um, like, uh, what's what's the word? Like, um, cleanliness, almost. Like, so so things that are right. kagare aren't just sex. It's also, like, uh, blood, childbirth, um bodily fluids in general dirt can right. can, can make you kagare um and so it's less like a it's less like a sin like it's not necessarily like oh i did something um like bad it's more like the gods don't like things that are kagare so if you want to talk to the gods you have to like cleanse yourself and a lot of that was based out of like early ways of making sure people you know stayed clean and didn't like bring a bunch of diseases into into everyone's hey guys. house um, Hygiene is important because the gods, because <laughs> the gods like it. <laughs> exactly, um, but over time, and you know, with with the introduction of like some Confucian ideals and uh, even a little bit of Buddhism, um, it did end up having some sort of sexist connotations to it in terms of like, oh, women are just constantly kagare because of that menstruation. Mm -hmm. um, which is so, I mean, like, I don't want to pretend like there's, there's nothing like, I don't want to pretend like there's nothing like slightly sexist or like this idea of like. Um, virgin purity being sort of like idealized because I think that is built into it, but it's a little different. So I, I feel like it's important to kind of keep those cultural contexts in mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also the fact that like, it does not matter that they're like, it's not like it's because they're unmarried. Like Miyaka and Tamahome could get married tomorrow and, and have sex purely for the sake of procreation and it would still be Kagare and the gods would not be into it. Because the body, um, there are body fluids involved. Right. Yes. Um, so, but yeah, so Tidescoon tells her, tells Miyaka that you, you can't do this thing. Um, and again, none of this really changes that a lot of this kind of comes down to like sex has, sex is bad. The gods won't like you. Um, but I do want to frame it in the context of the actual, um, the culture where this would be coming from. Um, so I wanted to start with all that. And then I wanted to add that, um, Per at personal as a kid who was really super not into physical intimacy um and and i shouldn't just say was isn't um i this kind of made me happy because i was like oh man i could go into this book and just be awesome at this um which you know i mean i was in i was in middle school getting ready to go into high school like a lot of people around me were all like let's make out or um sometimes more than that um even though they were like 14 and probably shouldn't have been um but, uh, so like having a story where like you got to be the hero because if you weren't into like banging made me, made me sort of happy. Um, but that, that's a, that's a personal note that has nothing to do with the fact that this is, this is culturally and socially kind of bullshit. No, I mean, that's um, cute. Fushigi Yugi as like a secret stealth power fantasy for ace kids is cute. Yeah. I, I would like that <laughs> version of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's what it's. That's what it was. That was that was what Tati's point all along. Sure. Yeah, it wasn't about um, <laughs> like if we even yeah. kiss even once, we're gonna bone down. So I have to break up it, with you under false pretenses. Well, yeah, Miyaka's Miyaka's response to this is very silly um, because oh, because like, she doesn't talk to him. She doesn't. She doesn't explain it to him. him. She doesn't tell him what's going on. Uh, she finally does when Tamahome forces the issue, which is like the one time a guy being kind of like I. I think he's a little too aggressive. He kind of like, put, he doesn't push yeah, her up punch, against the wall, but he kind of does. Punching the wall, does. Is, punching the wall it's, is not okay. It's crossing a line, but like, I completely understand his frustration because he's yeah. like, he's like, we were like clearly very much in love like a day ago. What is going on? Um, and he even yeah, knows, he's like, like, what did Tidescoon tell you? Come on, what, what did she say? 
Um, and, and then Miyaka still kind of tries to play it off. So I, and then, and I will give Tomahome credit. Um, after Miyaka explains it, he's like, okay, if that's what we have to do. Okay. It's going to suck. He's like, that sucks. Right. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. I, I, well, I wish we could have one thing. No, go ahead. I wish we could have skipped straight to that as opposed to the, the bullshit beforehand that only yeah. lasts. Yeah. Thankfully, it's only like, thankfully, it's only like one episode, but it is, it is bullshit. Um, yeah. and the one, that, that... the one thing I will... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Caitlin. Um, I mean, it was, you know, it's all about inserting dramatic tension. I do want to say that scene has probably the most expressive animation in, like, that whole episode is, like, 90% garbage animation, but then that one yeah. scene has this incredible expressive animation. Mm-hmm. Like, just, like, every, like, ed, like every, they're expressing their emotions with every inch of their bodies. Um yeah. They're very frustrated Which is like, about the like, fact that they're just super the horny in the <laughs> whole stretch of episodes. Yeah, it does look very good. Um, and the one the one thing I will say for this is is you know obviously like like we said like this kind of like putting putting virginity on a pedestal stuff is 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 bullshit. Um, the the thing I will kind of give for Shigi Yugi is Miyaka and Tamahome's reactions to it are basically like yeah this is bullshit. Um, and I do kind of like that. It's it's again we've talked about like how Shigi Yugi is kind of a kind of has like a snapshot quality to it. And Taitsukun telling Miyaka, like, you, you can't do this thing very much feels like, like these social cultural pressures enforced on teenagers by like these outside authority figures and this sense of like, oh, well, we can't do this because if we do like, you know, we'll be, we'll be shunned or judged or et cetera. Um, and the fact that they're frustrated by it and they hate it, um, is, I don't know, I guess it's, it is at least true to life if, if, if not, if not the best, um, the best message necessarily. Oh, yeah. I think that uh, I think that holds together until some of the later stuff involving the virginity subplot, at which point it gets a lot more skeevy. Yeah, we'll yeah. we'll get we'll we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Um, I'm just talking about about in in this particular moment. I did because in my head I had forgotten how like angry Miyaka and Tamahome are about the fact that they that they can't bone down. Um, and I'm like, guys, all they just said virginity. You can still make out ferociously. <laughs> like you've been you've been smooching up to this point. Um, you yeah. can you can keep smooching. Clearly, that hasn't had an effect. Um, so, but they apparently decide that that they just would never be able to control themselves. So they decide to to temporarily break up. I guess is the way mm-hmm. I would describe it. Um, and that's again, I, I definitely wanted to talk about that. Um, I feel like I I feel like I sort of said all the words do you guys have anything else you want to add yeah no i, th- um, I think that's the... a that's a good point yeah. like just looking at it where it is that works mm-hmm. yeah um yeah i i you know and i did want to talk about the um so you know the scene where miyaka chiri's fishing and miyaka just sort of comes over and sits down next to him and starts talking about like her what she, what she's been going through i think is sort of the most emotionally honest part of this one of the most emotionally honest series scenes in the whole series cuz mm-hmm. like she, you know she's very much about keeping uh the like keeping up a brave front until like it cracks and then it's all like kind of histrionics um you know everything like ev- ev- everything is just like very very strong with her so this quiet moment where she actually sits down with him and talks about calmly what she's going through mm-hmm. and her insecurities and like how hard it is for her but she's not like weeping and wailing um i really like that sort of like quiet moment um and you know and then and and i think that quiet moment is what allows chichiri to open up about what happened to him because if everything is, you know, he's he he's an adult, <laughs> and he's, if he's a, surrounded he's a by adult, teenage yeah. by teenage hysterics all the time. Like, um, he's not gonna have any time to sort of talk about himself. Um, yeah, I think up to, well, and I think up to this point, well, like, I mean, he's clearly kind of kind of a uh, a guy who kind of keeps things close to yes, the chest. I mean, that's he literally true. wears a mask. So there's that, there's that to start with. Like, I think he's not the kind of person who opens up like willy nilly anyway. Um, and then, like you said, like up to this point, it's kind of been the sense of like, well, I'm babysitting the kids. Um, no, no time for me. Um, and then, and I think he opens up as much to kind of help Miyaka as he does. Like, I don't think this is for him at all. Like he's like, I feel comfortable enough to tell her this thing, but I'm also telling her it kind of to give her an, 
almost a worst case scenario. And then to say, and then to say, like you know, uh, the communication is important, and not lashing out, and so like, good on you, uh, kind of. Yeah, just you know, the, the, this quiet moment of mentorship, um, which I thought was really nice. No, I think it is. I think there's, I think there's a lot of really good stuff that comes out of it. Um, I think Miyaka vocalizes a lot of things we've we've talked about about her character, like how she kind of wishes she had a mask that she could wear to smile all the time. Um, which is very much that part of her that feels like she can't tell anyone about like when she's upset um, and how she, she talks a lot. She talks a couple of times in this episode about this idea of like, is it, is it asking too much to want to have both Tamahome and Yui to both want to have like a close romance and a, and a close friendship. Um, and I think that a lot of her conversation with Chichiri kind of uh, spins back to that, that central frustration of hers that like, I don't want to have to compete even though everyone's telling me I'm supposed to. Right, and and the show sort of recognizes that she's stuck. Like, there's no there's no easy answers for her at that moment. If you just do the right thing, then, like, you'll get what you want. You'll live happily ever after with everyone who loves you. Um, that, that may not, like... You know, I feel like a lot of um, series aimed at teenagers sort of have this very gung-ho idea it's like well if you just you know do your best everyone will understand and you'll figure it out and you'll get everything you know you'll get what you want in the end because you have honest intentions and the shows take some moments like maybe it won't work out that way like yeah they're, when they're, you know, if, if nothing you, else they're like it's a lot more complicated than just you know be honest and everything's fine yeah. um so um and i do I think, yeah, I think a lot of the stuff, I think this, the, I think the kind of what Chichiri talks to her about is, is very important. Like he says, like, he's like, you didn't do anything wrong. Um, he's like, I don't think Yui really did either. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I think at the very, I think at least early on, Yui didn't do anything wrong. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and it, it's a good moment. It makes me sad because I love my boy and watching the show, um, the first time through, I remember getting to this point. I already, he was already my favorite character and I, because he was like, you know, goofy and kind of fun. And, and then this happened. I was like, Oh no, he's sad too. <laughs> and then, and then there, and then there, and then my heart had been handed over and that was that. Um, but I can't get into it too much because um, one thing that's very interesting about this is um, not to spoil anything, but we will return to this. We will get this story again from a different angle is what I will say. Um, and it's, and it is interesting. What is interesting about this, about what we're told right now is that this is from his perspective. This is what he tells Miyaka the way he sees this going down. And we will get it from a more, from a uh, more distant perspective later. And that will kind of change things. So I don't want to talk too terribly much about the specifics. Um, but I think kind of the, I think the important parts about it are um, kind of, a warning to Miyaka. Um, also, it sheds a lot, a lot of light on a lot of Chichiri's past actions where you were like, oh, he's just a nice guy. And he is a nice guy. But like also like his, you know, his sympathy for Hotahori, um, his willingness to to really let Miyaka like put her life at danger anytime Yui's involved. Um, like when Miyaka gets captured, he's like, Yui's not going to let her die. It's fine. Don't worry. Um, I think a lot of that um, sort of comes into light when you when you get more of his his own kind of back backstory experiences and this sense of like I would like these kids to not make the same mistakes I did if I can if I can do that so uh this is why it's important to have a mentor figure around um uh the one thing he does say that I that I did sort of highlight is he makes a point of like basically like um he says whichever one you take you'll lose the other which I think is very sharply covered, colored by his own experiences and is kind of what Miyaka is trying to avoid. Um, so I think kind of the question going forward is if Miyaka is able to find a way where you don't have to choose between love and friendship. Like if, if there is a way to, to bridge those gaps and find a way to uh, repair both those relationships. Um, and the final like really important thing he says is he says, I guarantee you he loves you. Um, and that's and that's why in the end I think I think the two of you will be able this this will work you'll be able to save her um, and I think that I think that that's I think that's what Miyaka needed to hear in that moment I think he says some stuff that she needed to hear that's like harsh but then he also tells her some things that are true that she maybe didn't know um, and I think that one's really important because at this point they are going to be directly competing for these Shinzaho um, and 
so I think I think me um it's gonna be harder and harder for Miyaka not to see Yui as like an enemy. And so having that assurance from somebody else who has kind of met Yui, um I think that's good for her too. Well, and it's set up uh, as a nice contrast to the uh, the Yui scene, which is essentially the same mentor pep talk, but uh, relentless gaslighting. Oh. Yeah, Nakako is terrible. There's a lot of kind of interesting mirror um, work done this week between Miyaka and Yui. Like, there's the moment early on where Miyaka, um, where Hotohori kind of starts to mack on Miyaka, and then, like, Tomahome, Bizarro Tomahome is macking on Yui, and it's like, they're very similar looking scenes. Um and then, and then, like you said, like with the with the different mentors, and it's like, oh, one of these mentors is a good person, the other one is the worst. Uh, Not even a, a big, fun trash a boy, problem. just an asshole. No, Naka goes. Uh, what, why does he likes him for reasons I do not comprehend? He's he's the he's terrible because he's um, pretty. No, but he, you can I tell. Mean, eh. You can tell when she likes a villain character because they're pretty. Yeah, that maybe that's it. Um, but I did, okay, so actually I think this is a good, um, sorry, uh, did, Bri, did you have anything else to say about, um, No, no, there's, there's nothing more we can, um, no, I, I think you guys covered it, like, well. Cool. I like that. I like that scene a lot, and he's, he is my, it's possible I've seen that scene, like, an an obscene number of times, (laughs) because it's possible I wrote a lot of fan fiction. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, that's not, that's neither here nor there. Um, no, I think that's a good, I think that's a good dovetail into Yui and the, the stuff going on in Kuto, which we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. And then finally we will cap with dead toddlers. Um, the event you've been waiting for. Yeah. I I do want to, I do want to definitely touch on, on Yui and her, and her Seryu, her trash Seryu fan, her garbage Seryu family. That's better. Uh, trash is, trash can be good. Garbage is not. Um, so, um, there are two kind of things with Yui that I um, I was personally kind of wanting to discuss. Um, one of them was, um, I think the series is I think the series walks a very careful tightrope with this um, idea of like um, feelings versus actions. I guess is how I would word it. Um, there's a moment when Tamahome is leaving when he's no longer Bizarro and he's leaving. And he says to Yui, he says, I sympathize with what happened to you, but I can't. And he, he uses the word yudisu, which the subtitles translate as forgive. But I think it's probably better to be something closer to like, I can't excuse what you've done yeah. like to me and to Miyaka. Um, and I think that I think it's I think it's really easy when you have um, characters who have gone through the kind of trauma that Yui has. I think it's really easy to either completely vilify them um, or completely woobify them. Um, and make it like, oh, nothing they do is their fault. Poor babies, they're just acting out. Um, and I, it's a real careful tightrope, but I think Fushigi Yugi is trying to walk this line of going, no, what happened to you is absolutely terrible. That having been said, she did drug this guy and force him to kind of become like her love slave. Um, like, like, and with- that's not cool. Like, like, like your own, like, <laughs> like cool. just because you're like your own hurt does not excuse you hurting others. I think is, right. is, right. is what's sort of happening there. Yeah. And I think that it's interesting, like, because he's talking specifically about what she did to him, which is definitely an action she takes on her own. Because like, I, I do, I'm so, def- like, I'm so almost defensively team Yui at this point because I keep, I, I just like her so much. Um, but, and, and, and like, yeah, like she pulled some bullshit with Tamahome and I think that's that's yeah she broke up their relationship and she tried to override somebody's own will because she liked them but then a lot of the the larger action she takes Nakago is always around pushing her to do things against her better judgment yeah no and there is there's absolutely an an aspect of a lot of of Yui's character in that she is being um manipulated and gaslighted as we have talked about by um a what like I think Nakago is like 10 years older than her I mean he's in his 20s at least he might not be quite that much older um, I think he's like by, the by, oldest character by an adult. I mean, she is, you know, but, but my point being like by an adult character who is, you know, who is very much like every scene we see of him, he is, he is working her in some way. Yeah. Like um, whenever he, he, he says something to her, the scene ends with him sort of smiling sinisterly. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, you know, and again, we, we always kind of, we always have like a Yui watch, right? Like, is the show turning, is the show turning her into like a straight up villain? Um, and, you know, and how does that play into like what we know about her as a character? And then like, or is it, you know, and I, so I think at this point she doesn't read like as nothing but a victim, which I think is good. 
But um, I also don't think she reads like a villain, um, especially after like that conversation Miyaka and Chichiri have. I think that conversation really frames it in kind of a way of like, there's a lot going on here, but she's not a bad person and she'll be like, like you can still help her and get her out of this terrible situation, yeah. hopefully. Like it's, um, it's, she's done bad things that are unquestionably bad things she should atone yes. for, but she hasn't done anything unforgivable because like yeah. Mi- Miyaka and Tomohome are together again now. I mean, he they died, um, but <laughs> and she's and she's fifteen, so I mean, yeah. he, he he bled out a little bit. He didn't actually die. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he, you know, he was only mostly dead. I've learned I've learned from the Princess Bride. There's a big difference. <laughs> um, but and you know, I mean, for all that, Yui is very uh, she's very kind to Suboshi after he loses his brother. Um, which I think is a good scene to have there is um, is Yui being like, I oh, completely speak, understand no. the trauma you're going through. Um, go ahead and cry. Uh, like, I think <laughs> Yui needed somebody to do that for her yeah. and they didn't. Um, it's a damn shame Nakago then immediately gets in Suboshi's head and works him the yeah. way he works Yui. Speaking um, of woobified villains. <laughs> oh, yeah, you... You treated Suboshi, you said that the first time you watched this through Suboshi was a big wooby to you, right? Oh, yeah. Like, you it's... were just like, poor baby, he's so sad. Yeah. Um, it's... Wait. Yeah. Once again, it goes back to, I sympathize what happened to you, but I can't excuse what you did. Like, speaking of brain, like, um, speaking of bad versus unforgivable actions. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, which, you know, hey, actually, this is this is the segue, you guys. We found the segue. Uh, Nakago, <laughs> Nakago uses Tsuboshi's raw teenager feelings to spin them into the most destructive possible outlet, um, which, again, does not, I'm not, again, just because Tsuboshi's being manipulated does not excuse what he does. Mm-hmm. Um, so Tsuboshi decides that he's going to go to Tamahome's house and murder his entire family. Yep. And then we, the audience, get to experience that basically, like, as it's happening. A little bit. Um, so here we are, guys. Here we are at the end of part one, Dead Toddlers. Um, <laughs> thoughts? Um, I kind of find it relentlessly emotionally manipulative. Like, I find the scene yeah, where he's burying yeah. them a lot more effective than the actual dying toddler yeah, moment. It is. No. The actual dying toddler is... Has I don't think it's ever maybe the first I time I watched the show it got me. But... Hate Yui Ren. She is my his... least favorite character in this whole thing. His, his little, little sister. She who... does not act yeah. remotely like a five year old. She's the most um, like she's just sort of there to say cutesy things and oh yeah like make the like and when she's alive she does it to make oh Miyaka and Tomahome are blushing embarrassed and then like yeah. And then now, nah, oh god, like yeah, she is she, sugary cute, and the scene with her like dying in his arms is, I agree. Like I find that I find it relentlessly emotionally manipulative, and the whole thing is. But that scene to me feels the worst because it really does feel like, what's the saddest possible thing I could do here? <laughs> oh yes, dying toddler. <laughs> um, that's that's the one. And then, but then there's, but you know, I mean, I say it's emotionally manipulative, but there's still moments later on in the episode where freaking every time i tear up um, oh it, god it gets me when he um, when he actually when he finds chue, chue? holding and holding he thinks the he tri- and he yeah and he remember and he realizes he tried to protect him that moment that, that moment kind of wrecks what me got me that that was yeah the, the moment that really got me yeah that moment that moment gets me and then and then like Bri was saying when he's when he's burying them and miyaka kind of comes out to try to to try to kind of comfort him and he's like i can't stop crying and i really just need you to leave me alone um that to me um, is that rawness, that kind of emotional honesty that I think when Fushigi Yugi nails, it nails it very. It's very affecting, and that and that 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 after effect of Tamahome just being upset and not and not playing it in the way that a lot of romance series play it, where like Miyaka like hugs him back to to being better. He's like, no, I I need some time right now. Um, I thought that that was really good, like as opposed to the as opposed to the very, um, I guess just like cliche. Um, just very kind of um, calculated. That's the word of of Yui Ren dying in his arms. Like that feels very calculated to me, and a lot of the the rest of it feels um, even if the event itself is still a very calculated. Like let's cause Tamahome some pain, right? And um, also free least... him up to not you know worry about things besides Miyaka now. Yeah, yeah. That's that is something we'll we'll be able to get into more. Like um, I think next week because we don't really see a lot of the after effects of this at this point. Um. um by the way. Why didn't they move his family into the palace a lot earlier? Yeah, Hodahori, what the fuck? 
Well, because they were still rivals in love, guys, <laughs> and Hodori couldn't do anything nice early. Um, no, I don't. I don't know. That they is... really like they're like Tomohomi's village is like on the border. They should have moved his family into the into the city like a long time that ago. That is a massive plot hole, honestly. Like. It was a mistake. I think. I think maybe the idea was like, well, we don't want to force them to leave their home, and their... Tomahome's around, <laughs> the, so their it's beautiful, fine. Spacious and now Tomahome's going to be like overseas. So huh? their beautiful, spacious home that they that they would love so much. Do... Well, I mean, it's still home. I'm sure they've all grown up there. I'm, I'm sure they would be loath to leave unless it was, you know. Um... So I could I, I can kind of see why yeah. it took a little while, but it should have at that, least been brought up seems, sooner. That just seems like a justification. Sorry, it is. It's, no, I. You're right. It is. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's yeah. No, it's it's um. That always irritated me. Is like his family's there, living in poverty, sick dad. Tom Homie's in the like goddamn palace. He's basically a government employee by now. Like. What are they doing? He is an essential person to the empire. Yeah, like, and I get, I get Tomahome not feeling like he could ask, but it should have Hotohori should have mentioned it or me. Somebody, it should have been offered. Yeah, at least. Oh. Um, but anyway, because yeah, he is, he is basically a government employee. And at this, this point. all could have been avoided. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. But then, how would we be sad? So, so what you're telling me is it's all Hotohori's fault. Yes, I'm willing yeah. to confirm to this narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is Hotohori's fault. That's that is that is, is by consensus the he is the answer actually here. the self villain of the series. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> um, no, and it is like so. It's emotionally manipulative. Agreed. Um, and it's it's kind of shitty that essentially it is there to forward. Um, it's the moment that Miyaka realizes that she's willing to fight the Seryu warriors, not Yui, but the Seryu warriors, because they're they've done an, they've done something that is unforgivable. Um, and child yeah i'm i'm going to go with unforgivable uh and and you get the sense i don't know how explicit it is in the narrative but uh you definitely get the sense that that is why nakago did it that's why he pointed the the rage machine that was suboshi in the direction of that family is to push miyaka towards actively um be- not de- I mean, Yui's going to see it as her, like, declaring war because now they both... Now, Yui was willing to just give up if Miyaka didn't go after the Shinzo And now Miyaka is is raring to go. And now Yui feels like, oh, well, it's a competition now and I can't let her win. So if she's going to do it, then so am I. Um, Yui's very reactive in that sense. And I think that I think that ties into this idea that she's working very, very hard to hate Miyaka um, that Shichiri talks about. Maybe that's why I, I'm so willing to bend over backwards to like see her side of things is because she is so frequently robbed of agency and basically everything. She is. She, she frequently is. Yeah. And well, and some of it is, is she she kind of herself um, frames it that way as, and frames it that way or um, willingly takes a semi passive role like in this situation where she goes, well, I'm not going to do anything until Miyaka does. And then Miyaka does. And she goes, OK, well, now it's OK. Now if I, I have do to do it. something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so she kind of tries to, I think moments like that show you Yui's mentality and how from her perspective, Miyaka is the villain yeah. mm-hmm. a little bit she or how she's Miyaka trying to see it that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Miyaka as, as the aggressor in this situation. Um, so that will be the mentality of the characters as we, uh, as we barrel into part two. Uh, so on the downside, you know, we ended on, we ended on some, some, a lot of, a lot of dead bodies. <laughs> uh, on the bright side, Hotohori has been written out of the show. Hooray! Uh, on the other downside, it's very possible he was somehow the glue that held this messy but entertaining enterprise together. Uh, but that is a story for another podcast. <laughs> As we move into part two, which is, again, an, we're trying not to spoil anything, but we also don't want people to be blindsided. Part two is, part one is is messy, but there's some po- there's a lot of positives, and it is I think it is very fun, if nothing else. Um, part two loses a lot of those adjectives I just described for at least part of it. Not for the whole thing, but for at least part uh, of it. Spoiler alert, um, I asked to lead next week. <laughs> yeah, Vry's leading next week, and there's there might be... Uh, bring bring your margaritas, because we got lots of salt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me put it like that. Uh, next, Yeah, so next week things things are probably going to take a more critical bent than they have up to this point, and, and knowing, knowing me and my 
horrible nostalgia goggles, I will still probably pull something emotional out of the damn thing. But, uh, you know. Any other thoughts? I don't think so. We had a lot of feelings this time, apparently. Fushi Yugi, it will make you feel an emotion. <laughs> you will have an emotion. <laughs> TM. <laughs> <laughs> That indeed, uh, and and I think I think that was very much the case this week. So yeah, no, that was. I think we we got through everything that I had noted down. So if y'all are good, um, I can. And we we did we did go over. So I had a feeling we might. So that's that's all good. Um, I'll talk. I have some other fun kind of supplementary material, but I'll wedge that into one of our later podcasts. And we'll probably just shout for thirty minutes and then run out of things to talk about. So uh, it'll be all good. Um, okay. So that having been said, uh, that's going to do it for. That's, ugh, I'll start over. That's going to do it for today's watch along. Uh, for those of you following along at home, our next Fushigi Yugi podcast will cover episodes 28 through 35. Um, so it's another seven episoder, but 28 is a recap episode, so there's not really going to be anything for us to talk about there. You can watch it if you need to, um, but it's, it's just a straight recap. There's no extra material in it. After the, after the recap is over, we will put on our parkas and head off for some adventures in the frozen north with Miyaka and her merry band of warriors. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Chatty AF. If you like what you heard, tell your friends or leave a nice review for us on iTunes. And if you really like what you heard, please consider tossing a dollar or more to our Patreon each month. Your support goes a long way towards making Anime Feminist happen, both in print and in your earbuds. If you're interested in more from the team and our contributors, please check us out at www.animefeminist.com, on Facebook at Anime Fem, on Tumblr at Anime Feminist, and on Twitter at Anime Feminist. And that's the show. Thanks for listening, homies. Be sure to throw down your own thoughts in the comments, and we will catch you next time. <laughs>